I'm incredibly um, honored to be moderating the Indigenous Perspectives panel. Um, this is a really important panel for a lot of different reasons. Um, I'll just go into a couple. Um, one of those is that the tribes in Washington State are the first stewards of our marine resources and our marine species and our terrestrial species and our terrestrial resources, um, and as such have been living with and protecting and restoring and stewarding these resources since time immemorial. And so there's a lot to for them to share and for others to learn from them um, in terms of how they have been stewarding these resources and how they are currently interacting and protecting and managing these resources. Um, many people know this, but tribes in Washington State are absolute leaders in habitat protection. Um, they are the voices saying we are losing more habitat than we are gaining and that we, we cannot continue in this way. We have to start regaining our habitat. So um, that's one reason. Um, a second reason why this panel is so incredibly important, why really appreciative of everyone being here today to share um, you know, their knowledge is what Meg talked about in the very beginning. So thank you, Meg, for framing this um, early on that tribes in Washington State are co-managers of the resources. Um, so they have their rights reaffirmed through both um, Bolt and Rafi decisions. So many of the tribes in Washington are co-managers of the fish and shellfish resources with the state of Washington. And they have legal authorities within these areas. And so um, I'm not gonna go into too much other than that. Everyone, again, my name is Tiffany Waters. I'm a Chinook tribe member. I'm also at the Nature Conservancy. And I'm gonna allow everyone here to introduce themselves. We have representatives um, from Jamestown Squalum tribe, from Suquamish tribe, Skokomish Sk tribe, and Squaxin Island tribe. So I'm gonna kick it off here with you, Lonnie. Aha, testing? Okay. I tang and siam nischayacha siam, yuch siam snatch tiklam nusk ayamsen, hatning sanati and satla, yait kuyati and satla, man shot short sin, man white squatchy. A uh, very good day to you all, honored friends and relatives. That's how we say in nusk ayamutsen, they're the squalam language, the language of the lower Elwa squalam, the Jamestown squalam, and the Port Gamble squalam people. My name is Lonnie Grinnell Greninger, but my Indian given name is Yuchsia, which means inviter. I love that about my name. And uh, that was given to me by my grandmother when I was 15. Nothing magical about the age of 15. It just happened to be the age that I was when, as she, the matriarch of the family, decided it was time to give all of her three children and her nine grandchildren their traditional names. So that's pretty neat. I currently serve my people as the vice chairwoman of, of the tribal council. So for those who might be less familiar with tribal governments and where we stand as sovereign nations, my position, and think about at the position titles as each of us are introducing themselves, they represent entire nations, just like the United States, just like France, Spain. So for me as a vice chairwoman, I represent a, like a vice presidential role in the governing structure of my tribe. So I handle a lot of policy, and then uh, we handle treaty rights, figuring out how to protect our treaty rights and our resources, figuring out how to, in this day and age where we have evolved with new technologies, Western science moving in, how do I take all of that and protect my sovereignty and my treaty rights and my resources and my people, my people and my lands all at the same time? But one thing that's part of my role in, this, in my tribe is I depend on my in-house experts, whether they're native or non-native, I depend on them to help me with a really difficult job, but it's essential. I depend on them to translate Western science methods, tools, and research into our indigenous Jamestown perspective, and then figure out how to beautifully blend those things together so that I am stewarding the lands like I'm supposed to, like the creator told me to thousands of generations ago. That was our job, and it's still our job. It hasn't changed, but things have been evolving, right? We're in these new technologies, new days. We had our own indigenous science, it looked different, but now we gotta blend things together. So that's part of my role, and you'll hear more about my thoughts today on this panel, but just to give an introduction of what my role is here today, and, and I'm really eager to continue speaking with you all and um, sharing my thoughts today. Hello, my name is Azure Bore, uh, Suquamish tribe member. Uh, my Indian name is Tsiotsum. I am the traditional food and medicine program coordinator for our tribe. And so I am more, on, I am not policy, I am more hands on the ground, collect, using our resources, using our resources before we lose them. 
And so uh, my big passion is making sure that this, the information that I'm teaching our youth, our elders, our members, is those resources are there for their kids, their grandkids, you know, like for generations to come. Um, not only the knowledge that I'm passing on, but also th those resources remain. Um, Suquamish is the birthplace of Chief Seals. We have, who signed the Point Elliott Treaty. The Pacific, or the Puget Sound is a huge, a huge cultural asset to us. Like we lived our lives completely surrounded by the Puget Sound. And so everything that we do and have done kind of revolves around the seasons, the seasonality of what, of the foods that we ate. Our ancestors ate hundreds of types of different foods every year, hundreds. And where we, dozens, you know, we are, our food diets now are so limited. This was exciting to me to get something more back into our, our tribal members' um, diets, that it's as important as camas. We're also wa working on the Kalka project. Like, these things are monumental for us as sovereign people. You can't truly be sovereign if you cannot feed yourself. And so this um, type of work, I get really excited. <laughs> I get really excited. And um, so I am a big cheerleader. I'm a great cheerleader. And I am just really happy to be here for that reason. Then I can offer my perspective. And, you know, I, I do have a Bachelor of Science, but I don't consider myself a I have traditional ecological knowledge. That's my science. Let's um, continue this work together and make sure that these resources are around for a very long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Dickerson, and I'm a carpetbagger. I've uh, I was born in Rhode Island, and I came out here uh, 40 years ago, and uh, I stayed, and uh, I have the great honor to work for 36 of those years that I've been here for the Squaxin Island Tribe. As was mentioned earlier, the lands you're on are the lands of the Squaxin Island people. Um, they lived on all these inlets around here in South Puget Sound. So there's a great affinity for the marine waters and all the species that live there. And we continue to be actively involved in addressing those issues. And I, as a fish biologist, serve that role that Lonnie mentioned, that you know, trying to work with science and convey that to the tribal governments. And it's always been a very important consideration for the tribes to have the best scientists available to them. So I'll be interested to answer some of the questions and we'll get into those issues. Hello, my, <clears throat> my name is uh, Blair Paul and um, I'm a, um, a Clinket tribal member from Alaska. My family has moved down to Seattle, um, my grandfather's generation, uh, through a series of, uh, they were lawyers and um, that was where the a lot of legal was, um, decisions were made during that time period. And so I've been grew up in Seattle and have been around the ocean all my life and got involved in um, large algae micro, cultiva micro algae cultivation in Hawaii in the 2007 time frame after finishing a graduate degree at Western. Um, and have, uh, so I spent about three and a half years at, at a big biofuel project there. And when I moved back to the region, started um, consulting with hatcheries and sort of applying that microalgal cultivation knowledge to the shellfish industry. And then um, got involved with uh, Port Gamble Squalum at the time in 2012-13 time period and did a couple years there as a shellfish biologist and, um, and then applied that. So I then moved to a hatchery in, in Shelton, uh, Clamfresh, and then got involved with Skokomish about six years ago and have been their shellfish biologist ever since. Um, and so for the past 10 years, both with Port Gamble and Skokomish, it's my, my duties have really revolved around intertidal shellfish population estimates, um, subtidal gooey duck population estimates, um, crab and shrimp test fisheries, 
uh, restoration work of Olympia oysters um, and quota setting process with the co-management system. So we, um, you know, I'm responsible to try and uphold the tribe's um, co-management responsibilities and ensuring that we set good, good um, targets for harvest and then have adaptive management when things need to be adjusted or, or whatnot. Um, and so that's sort of the perspective that I'll, I'll you know, hold through the conversation today. All right. Well, thank you all for the introductions. Uh, I think we're going to pass it back to Lonnie. And I'm going to kick us off with our first question. So um, what is your tribes and communities' relationships? I'm going to go here. A little bit. <laughs> Wait, go. I'm scared to touch it since the reverberation of earlier. <laughs> is it? Thank you. Oh, is it pretty good now? Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, what is your tribe's relationship with kelp and other seaweed as both a natural and cultural resource? Big question, but for yes. <laughs> however you'd like to answer that. All right, I would say that our relationship, so just Jamestown specifically, seaweed and kelp were always a part of our everyday life. So ancestrally speaking, we used kelp and seaweeds to line our cooking pits. So they were insulators to keep in heat, but also moisture for our clams and our camas plants, our prairie plants specifically when we were cooking them for, gosh, uh, sometimes days at a time, weeks at a time, they would be in those pits. Um, we, we ate it on a daily basis or a seasonal basis. And uh, we also used it as, you know, this was really interesting. I just learned this recently. We used bull kelp tubes in storytelling methods, like theatrical methods. And so as someone was on the stage in the longhouse telling stories, somebody would be behind stage making noises in the tube, you know, to add sound effects. It was pretty fun. So that was great. Uh, for when treaty, treaties were signed and uh, when settlers were moving in and we were being removed from our lands, yes, these things happened. Uh, some of our relationship with kelp and seaweed broke. And so now it feels like we're getting acquainted again. And we're learning what, what do we do with seaweed now? How do we reintroduce it into our diets? Like uh, she was saying earlier, because my, my generation, my dad's generation, and I don't think even my grandmother's generation grew up with seaweed in their diets as just an everyday thing. Um, so now it's something that we have, to re, we have to reintroduce to our people. And so we're trying to do that with our traditional cult, uh, foods and culture program. We're trying to do, uh, introduce through like kelp pickles you know, so it's something, pickles are something that we understand now, and so try to introduce those, those uh, ancestral vegetables back into our diets. We're trying that, uh, salsas, things like that. And then we're learning how to harvest it all over again. Um, one of the other things that we have tried to do, uh, we, we had some momentum toward it. We were going to actually do seaweed farming under our net pens for native fish. And it was going to help with the, oh gosh, I'm the, I am not a science person, so forgive me. Uh, I depend on my experts for this. Poop. Yes, poop. <laughs> Kelp was going to help with the fish poop. Thank you. <laughs> and we were going to introduce sea cucumbers under those pens as well. So the combination of the sea cucumber and the kelp, you know where I'm going with that. So uh, we lost some momentum with that, uh, unfortunately, when my uh, dad passed away about a year and a half ago. But we have some more staff who are taking on that mantle, and we're just doing some surveys now. So we went back a couple of steps, but it's something we want to continue to do and keep growing in our relationship with seaweed, both for our treaty, uh, but also for learning how to do it or deal with it every day. Although I will say that when I was a kid, we played with it a lot. We threw it at each other. We'd be running around on the sandy beaches, and we would run on it. We would play with it. We would take it and throw it. And of course, you'd get those bull kelp, and you'd whip it around and hit each other with it. And not really safe, but that's what we did. Um, so our... We're growing, is uh, how I'll conclude that statement on our relationship. Thank you. A lot of that, I was, I, I won't go back over a lot of that, but a lot of that was true for Suquamish as well. Um, one interesting that I read was that uh, we would hold the fish oil in the bowl, in the bulb, in the bulb part, yep. and then net material yes. would be made out of the, the, the bulbous, the, the stipe. Um, Again, like there was a there was a big disconnect for a couple generations. My mom's generation, they didn't get a lot of learning. And if it was, it was go get this, and you don't know you you're not told why or what they're gonna do with it, but you just go get it. 
you're not told the name of it or the traditional name. So a lot of that learning was lost with my great grandmother, when the matriarch of our family, when she passed. Um, and so I feel like that's my job. <laughs> Learn all this stuff all over again and not just teach my family, to, but to teach all the families. Um, so I am doing as much research as I can about traditional foods and seaweed. I've gone to two of Jennifer Hahn's walks that we've cooked seaweed, like 10 different recipes, and I was just like, this, yes, this. Um, and so COVID, you know, COVID happened and things kind of slowed down. I am a program of one, like I run my program by myself at this point. Um, but there's just so much possibility with this kelp. We did actually, when we went on canoe journey, we were in the San Juans and I had our canoes go pull in a bunch of bull kelp and we made pickles on canoe journey. Like we had the kids clean them, slice them, make the brine, and then we put them in the, the coolers. And every time we stopped, we would check on them. And we let them refrigerate in the coolers for like a week. And then when we got to our final destination, we got our chairman Leonard to try them. <laughs> we got um, some of our sports rec people that were like, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was just that experience and those kids remember that. Um, and that was a recipe that I got from that, that walk with Jennifer, and it, was, it just really uh, sparked my interest. And so if you know me, I get really excited about a lot of things. <laughs> but I think that helps getting that information across, like getting those people interested too. And once that's sparked, then they can go do their own um, research too. And I'm hoping that this is just one more way that I can get our community engaged in our traditional foods. We've done it with camas, we've done it with salmon, we've done it with um, our game meats and things like that. So this is just one more avenue to just really get that engagement with our community and make us feel like we are connected to our ancestors. We do, we eat, so my job is called the traditional food medicine. I hate that word. I'm like, this is who we are. This is what we do. This isn't traditional. This is what we're doing now. So I just haven't come up with a cool enough term to change it officially yet. <laughs> but um, so that's my, my hope for this project is, or for kelp coming back, is just another learning experience for our people. Thanks. Uh, these women obviously know a lot more about uh, their tribe's cultural uses of kelp and seaweed, and so I won't go down that road. Um, but, uh, you know, I am the scientist, and so I will talk a little bit about natural resources, uh, perspective on kelp. Um, of course, we're very interested, Squaxin's very interested in aquaculture. Um, there's a long tradition of uh, aquacultural practices in tribal country. And uh, we've been involved in shellfish and finfish, and we're looking to move into the uh, seaweed space and see how we can uh, integrate that into some of our other programs. But I'd like to specifically talk about the, the natural uh, bed at Squaxin Island. Um, it's uh, southernmost bed in uh, Puget Sound, at the head of the Sound. And uh, it's in a lot of trouble. It's been on a long-term decline. And then uh, we've experienced just recently a short-term disaster. It's in serious shape, and it's hard to say what exactly the reason for that is. Um, we've got lots of people helping us on this. We're looking to repopulate that bed. Uh, Betsy, Tom, you know, we've got lots of people contributing to the effort, and we really appreciate that. Um, we've invited them to the island to the reservation. Uh, we consider that bed to be on reservation. 
Um, one thing that I would point to, and there's been a little bit of talk today about temperature and, uh, and kelp. And when we had this um, disaster I'm describing, I went back and looked at the uh, temperature records, uh, the water temperature records from the uh, heat dome event. I'm sure many of you uh, remember that. And the temperature measurements that we, uh, we were able to log at Squaxin Island for that month were three degrees warmer than the 10-year average. I mean, it was a big event in terms of us, people, air temperature, but three degrees in the marine environment is pretty significant. Can't say that was the reason for our short-term disaster, but we need to keep keep looking at it. We've got also, though, the long-term decline of the bed. I mean, this bed has been in trouble before the heat dome. And, you know, one of the things that I look at is the fact that there's, uh, we, we don't have a lot of urchins in South Puget Sound, um, but we do have kelp crabs. And they're, they're just all over it. They're eating it down, you know, day by day through its growth cycle. And there's no natural predator working on those kelp crabs um, because, perhaps because uh, we don't have a sufficient rockfish population. How many people know that there are multiple species of rockfish in Puget Sound that are listed on the Endangered Species Act? Raise your hand. Well, that's... That's good. A lot of you are aware of that. And it's, it's a significant effect in this kind of ecological situation where there's nothing to eat the kelp crabs. So where have the rockfish gone? I don't know. The fishery's been gone for decades. Um, and I can't help but look at uh, what could be eating the fish is uh, where is the system out of whack? Well, we've got this gross overpopulation of marine mammals, seals in particular, seals and sea lions, pinnipeds. Um, something's eating those baby rockfish. They're never surviving to eat the kelp crabs. So that's the way, uh, that's the situation we're dealing with, and we're trying to figure that out. There's uh, still a lot of work to be done. Um, <clears throat> so the relationship with uh, kelp, you know, Skokomish is primarily a, um, a fin fish culture, like salmon culture, and, you know, the, um, the decline of salmon that's been experienced in the region, you know, has um, forced a lot of the, their cultural um, sustenance to really shift to shellfish, but there's really, uh, you know, anything that supports fish Salmon, anything, you know, the biodiversity associated with kelp is, is really important to the, to the tribe. And, you know, if you look at the historical records of the Hood Canal, um, most of the kelp is uh, going to be at the very northern range of the Hood Canal. Uh, it's, it's a very warm water body. So, um, you know, even the earliest, earliest maps that, have, that I've ever seen of, of where those, the distribution of kelp is, really it's in the very upper, upper portion um, near Hood Head where the current... Um, Joth Davis's farm is, and um, you know, right where the Hood Canal Bridge is, actually was a, was a bed right there. Um, so really, the reliance that the tribe had on is very much in terms of the the ecological benefit that the kelp beds provided in terms of biodiversity and just the um, a refuge. You know, as as migrating salmon move back and forth between um, the Skokomish River and and the other rivers, Quilcene River and the various other rivers of the of the Hood Canal. Um, and you know, I think that, that probably would summarize the main um, historical knowledge that I'm aware of that the Skokomish has relied on those, those kelp beds. And um, the people that I've talked to typically don't have a lot of memory of physical, the physical structures of the, the kelp beds because of that northern range um, that they existed in. 
All right, well, thank you all so much for, yeah, that really important information. Um, we're gonna go to the next question. So what comes to your mind when you hear the term seaweed aquaculture? Ooh. So when I hear the term seaweed aquaculture, I think about partnership with the land. I also think about how aquaculture has been in my veins for at least seven generations. My grandmother was just recollecting how fisher women in my family, we've been, fisher women have been around for at least seven generations. Not me, it goes through my sister now. Uh, I tend, I'm stuck at a desk and I'm okay. I get seasick real easy, so. <laughs> It's really weird to be Indian and have be seasick. Anyways, I'm also allergic to shellfish. <laughs> Strike two. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I can still help from a policy level. I can still help at the advocacy level. And so when my dad was in aquaculture, far, he, farming was just a no-brainer. It was just a no-brainer because I, we actually have photos of my, my great, great, great-grandfather off of Indian Island near Port Townsend, if anyone's familiar with that area. I have a picture of the Prince of Wales uh, and his wife and then his, a couple of his children. They're out there in the clamming beds. We were farming. We farmed for, for clams, oysters, we gooey duck, gosh, uh, urchin, seaweed. Like we, we farmed it all. So it was just a natural next step, and now we're just adding Western science to it. So we're working on uh, seaweed aquaculture at Jamestown. I mentioned a little bit of that, the example earlier. We're doing surveys. We're trying, we're trying out some seeding out there. I don't even know if I'm using the right terms. See, this is where I, non-science person. But I think you understand where I'm, what I'm talking about. But we want to try out net pens, things like that, and make sure that kelp and seaweed are a part of all of that. So for me, it's just a natural piece of the culture and uh, just trying to blend the new science and the new methods with it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that when I think of aquaculture, I think a, a little bit more of that ground level stuff, like from our growing up with my grandpa who dug clams with a straight fork, <laughs> um, to my great grandma who had, and my cousin Jay Mills will tell, tells the story beautifully about my great grandmother who had a patch a patch down below her house where that was her patch. And if you got caught catching clam or digging clams in her patch, you were in trouble. Um, I consider that aquaculture. I think that was, you know, she was getting up in age. My grandpa, my great grandpa had passed away already. She was on her own feeding a bunch of kids. So that was her way of ensuring that she could go get those clams later. Um, that to me is aquaculture. This, this whole new stuff with growing kelp and farms and things like that, I'm, it's all, it's a, it's a precipice for me. Like I'm just getting to the beginning of learning and understanding that part of it. Um, so I'm really glad to be in conversations right now about it. Um, but when I think of aquaculture, I think of those ground zero level um, where we started from and where we're getting to now. It's not the same, you know, we've got equipment as, as in, you know, indigenous people, we're always stepping up. Like, we'll, if we have a, prob, a project, we'll figure out how to get it done. If we have to upgrade our tools, we'll upgrade our tools. That's just, this is another step in that. We're upgrading our systems to maybe do it a little bit more efficiently, maybe a little bit more, and do more for the environment than just this one thing, you know. It's not just food it's for us, it's food for the environment. It's cleaning this, you know. So that's what I'm thinking. When I hear seaweed aquaculture, I go, oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> More to work with. Uh, like I said, the, the tribes have been uh, long term in cultural practices for uh, the marine environment. Um, You've, I'm sure you've heard stories about uh, clam gardens, and uh, you know we probably have heard that tribes used to uh, put fur boughs in the water to supplement the forage fish spawn. You know, th there's all kinds of practices out there that are traditional for tribes, and Squaxin has seized on those. Uh, like I said, living in the marine environment that they do. 
They are known as people of the water, and they have been involved in cultural practices for fish uh, for literally decades. Um, we were probably the first net pens in Puget Sound, and um, we grow gooey duck, we grow clams, we grow oysters. You know, there's all kinds of uh, aquaculture that the tribe's involved in. And so it just is a natural step to uh, proceed into the uh, seaweed environment. It's all part of the system. You know, everything's connected. I've, I've heard some of the math today. And, and, you know, I don't dispute it, but, you know, people have said, well, you know, you couldn't possibly offset all the carbon you need to offset by growing seaweed. Okay, fine. But that's not the only thing involved here. It's connected to all these other pieces, whether it's habitat, um, community commitment, just involvement with the environment, reteaching the younger generations the, the ways of old. There's all these parts to the equation that you've got to filter into this consideration of aquaculture. And, you know, I think Squaxin does a good job of that. And, you know, they may not be able to change the world with what they do, but they can change their neighborhood. Um, the term aquaculture, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about the term aquaculture. Um, you know, kind of learning how land-based large microalgal facilities operate in large ponds, quarter acre ponds, and looking at production, grams per square meter per day. And then, you know, getting involved in uh, shellfish farms and, you know, bag cultures, flip bags, and, you know, the various gear associated with that. And then, and then learning, you know, to, to manage natural populations, um, getting involved in enhancement efforts, seeding, seeding oysters, seeding, seeding clams, um, you know, and then, and then it's like, well, which part of that do we call aquaculture? You know, the, the human engagement with the, um, with the resource to, to plant, um, you know, seed out into the water system that grows? Is it the, is it the, which aspect is it really that would define that term? Is it, do we need a, a, a bag to put the oyster in to call it aquaculture? Or if I just put it on the beach and let it grow, is that aquaculture? Um, I don't know if I have really good clarity of that. You know, there's sort of different degrees of intensity and different degrees of, of equipment that's needed. Um, you know, even, you know, one could argue that restoring some of these natural river systems that have salmon spawning grounds could be considered a form of aquaculture or human engagement with, with the marine species, um, hatcheries. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion that I have in that regard, um, you know, and, and, but, I, but I think that the process of growing food in the water, you know, is something that's essential to, to Skokomish and to, um, to, to the tribes of the region, really. Um, nope, my daughter's calling there. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, a, that's sort of the, the thoughts of aquaculture, you know, and... Um, the the various forms and and some interact with uh practices that um skokomish is, is ongoing practices skokomish has of the water body in different ways that that others don't um uh, but i think that might be our next question so i won't jump this <laughs> all right wonderful um any other follow-ups to that or should we go on to the next question that was great you guys all right wonderful all right, our next question. Um, what would you like prospective Washington seaweed farmers to know before they pursue a permit? Ooh, okay. I had two thoughts. The first would be that I would ask any prospective seaweed farmer 
to, how do I say it? Acknowledge that your farm might be ancestral territory of a tribe. Um, maybe the tribe doesn't own it anymore, that land, but maybe you do um, because that's legal now. And so if you're going to farm on that land, think of, I would love for that farmer to think about what we do to the land. We, we were here to, we have a sacred duty to steward the land. So I ask that any prospective farmer would think about that and do good work on the land uh, with good heart and with good intention. Uh, the second thought I have is, hey, think about if there's a potential for partnership with the local tribe in your area. You know, maybe the tribe doesn't have a space for seaweed farming itself, and so they might partner with you. Maybe explore those types of options. That's my two. So I was thinking about it uh, a little, again, with the ancestral lands, but what we, what our tr treaties say is that we have usual and custom areas for our fishermen. And so a big thing about where are these gonna go? Are these going to be right in the middle of our crabbers crabbing grounds? Like those things, those that's where it's going to get tricky with these permitting issues. I think is that you're going to need to, you have to work with the tribes because you can't just plop your farm right in the middle of this grounds where they've been crabbing for hundreds of years. Like it, I think that's where it's going to get tricky. Thanks. Uh, permitting is an interesting question, and I know, uh, I know Blair's gonna go into some of the details of uh, some of the permits that relate to tribes, but I think you need to be aware that um, it's a complicated situation out there. Despite the characterization of, of co-management, um, the, the lawsuits have been specifically about fish and shellfish and more recently about culverts, but I'll tell you, there are multiple state agencies out there that refuse to consider co-management of all resources for, for tribes. Um, you know, a good example would be water. Uh, you know, Squawks and Island Tribe, people of the water, uh, state won't recognize the tribe as a co-manager of water. Um, so the tribes have to address their concerns in, in other ways, and that is what can get complicated. But what would I advise specifically, um, kind of reiterate the point, location, location, location. <laughs> you know, Squaxin is, uh, I hope I've conveyed that Squaxin is very favorable toward aquaculture. But you go and propose uh, a farm in the wrong location, and the wrong location would be like, you know, a drift reach for the gill netters. The fishers, we don't distinguish, we just call them all fishers. <laughs> the fishers would be pretty upset if you took away a, a, a drift, yeah. and, um, and they can affect an outcome if that conflict arises. I would also point to, I mean, we work pretty closely with uh, Taylor Shellfish um, in our neck of the woods. Right now, Taylor's proposing a large uh, floating shellfish nursery in Oakland Bay, and um, they've been working with us, they've been talking with us, and they are designing that facility such that if the tribe needed to launch a fishery in that location, they could detach their nursery and tow it out of the way. You just got to work with us. Um, yeah, I mean to reiterate, you know, early early connections with the with the tribe that's you know has UNA in the area that you're proposing a, a farm is critical. Um, you know, at Skokomish, it's I, I'm not in the department that reviews those permits, but the permits do come through, and and um, I'll be, 
you know, oftentimes in discussion with the people that are going through that review process. Um, and, you know, one of the considerations that's very, very relevant is, um, you know, the, the water body, you know, if we talk about Hood Canal, there's, there's a lot of production that comes out of, out of the water body in the form of, you know, all the various species, uh, whether it be the salmon that come up the rivers, but also the crab or the shrimp and the oysters, the clams and the gooey duck. And if you tally it all together, that's, that's a lot of production that comes out of the natural system. And so when there's a, um, an installation of something that could potentially impact that production, um, you know, it's the responsibility of the tribe to, just, to, to make sure that the, the production that's already taking place isn't going to be impacted. Uh, whether that be putting a, you know, a, a um, floating aquaculture system on top of a recovering gooey duck bed. I mean, these gooey duck beds are, the estimate right now is 55 years to be, you know, recovered from a, a harvest, which could take, you know, the harvest could be open for a decade, two decades, and then it'll be 55 years to recover. So someone might go, hey, there's nothing here, but in reality, it's year 20 of a recovery cycle. Um, so those are, you know, a lot of the thought processes that go through, you know, the office of how, you know, what's the tribe's position on this, as well as whether it's an area that, that does have active fisheries, as um, Jeff mentioned about, you know, that that is a very um, important aspect to the to the Skokomish is is making sure that they can um, fish in their usual areas and the places they've been fished for generations and um, but yeah so early early connections and and um, you know thinking of it in terms of partnerships of how to um, you know accomplish one's goal so that so that both parties would be beneficiary beneficiaries of that installation would be an important aspect. All right, well, wonderful. You give, please go ahead. I, I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper on, on the permitting. Um, it's really interesting. One of the critical permits I'm sure you're aware of is the Army Corps of Engineers. And a, a number of years ago, um, up in Suquamish territory, uh, there was a, a marina permit that the Army Corps issued and uh, it was in a fishing space, and it was litigated, and the Corps lost. The interesting thing about the Army Corps is once you tell them what to do, they will do it. So when they were told by the courts, you've got to honor tribal fishing rights, they do. And so when it comes to permitting, if a tribe stands up and objects to a permit, the Army Corps says to the proponent, you need to work with the tribe. We're not going to issue that permit until you resolve that issue. And you've seen that to this day from everything from mooring buoys to the coal terminal up in North Puget Sound. The Corps is a pretty powerful advocate for respecting treaty rights. Uh, one of the things we've observed a lot, you know, there's a lot of uh, oyster farms and shellfish permits that go through into the in the Hood Canal, and um, you know, I, I in general I get the sense that the that the group here today is sort of the front of a of a larger group that would be applying for permits, and and so. Everyone here seems to be very like, here's what we're going to do, and they, and they have best intentions. There's, there's other people that we deal with routinely in the Hood Canal that are not as such. They, um, you know, will land on somebody's property and take all the oysters, and then, the, you know, we get a call from someone taking all the oysters, and it's like, well, okay, there's a lot of nefarious actors. There's also a lot of um, somebody will get a permit for one thing, and then decades later, you know, they're up for renewal and we look at it and we're like, you were permitted for something completely different and now you're doing this. And so we're going to hold you accountable and that, and, and so that, and that happens. And it's, um, you know, so just being aware that there's, there's this reality when you've been operating in the same place for a long time, there's a memory there that can um, not make sense all the time for those that are sort of fresh, you know, like 
what's the objection to this? This is a good activity, and it might be, but it, but you know, right behind the door is this other person that that totally took advantage of a of an opportunity and did something completely different than what their permit um, was authorized for. And then in that same light, if if one finds they want to add multi-trophic species and add other components to the to their permit, you know, it's always totally a, a fine to update the permit, go through the process again. And that is a form of communication that will notify the tribes that, hey, there's proposing a modification to this. So that's an evaluation period. You know, a lot of times the permits form this channel of communication between all the different stakeholders. That's a really important, important part of the permit, you know, understanding that it, that it adds a huge amount of complication and, and cost and labor and, and, and all those various functions. But the communication aspect is, is really, really important to make sure that everybody's aligned with what's happening and has the chance to review it. All right, any final thoughts on that question? Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. We actually have a little over 10 minutes for questions. So, <laughs> so if people do want to come up to the mic, if you have questions, please feel free. I also have one question here, so I'll get started with this. And if others want to come up to the mic, please do. Um, how can prospective seaweed farmers work collaboratively with tribes to further develop social license for growing food in the water? <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I think you actually spoke to it. I mean, partner, mm -hmm. come talk with us. We're interested. And, you know, there's, there's opportunity out there. We, we all have an interest in this. And despite the fact that there's one state agency in the state of Washington that seems to think that they are the czar of all aquaculture and they're not working with anybody. Um, we actually want to work with everybody. So just yes. come and talk to us. Uh, social license for growing food in the water. I mean, obviously food is growing in the water. So, you know, one of the other, other things that, that has struck me listening to a lot of the discussions within the, the office in, in Skokomish as, as things have come through is that there's a long memory of the various attempts to do floating aquaculture in the, in the region. So if you go back, you know, the fish farms were installed. There was a push for that, but in the, I don't know, 70s or so before I was around. But then, and then there's a lot of mussel farms a decade or two ago. And um, so I think it's a really important concept to have examples at work. Here's Here's a floating kelp farm that produces this. We could look at the impacts it has this. You know, that type of, of information is critical for people who are going to evaluate it. And so that there's the, the scaling, you know, as, as Joth mentioned earlier, when things scale, they have to have smaller footprints to show that what the potential impacts would be. And then as, the, as things move along, then things can get bigger. But if one was to just install something large and have the impacts unknown, that's a risk to those that are relying on that on those resources um, for their cultural heritage and their sustenance and their economic viability. If I'm understanding social license correctly, uh, reputation matters when it comes to tribes and partnerships. Uh, so Jamestown is a really great example of this. We partnered with Cook Aquaculture for our, for our programs. Wasn't a great reputation at the time with the Atlantic salmon net pens that uh, broke apart, right? But we spent hours and hours in a contract negotiation discussion measuring the social capital of the tribe in dollars. What a weird conversation to have. What is my social capital and my reputation as a tribal government worth in this greater community as I'm gonna be pushing aquaculture forward, maybe into a community that is not quite favorable or not quite um, educated fully on what our, what, like what's our goals with aquaculture? What's our goals with Cook Aquaculture as a partner? So it, uh, when we're talking about building that social capital, it's gonna depend on are you a newer farmer trying to build reputation? Well then let's, let's have those really, really early initial conversations together. We'll tell you what we wanna see so that we can be that partner with you. If you're already established like Cook or maybe Taylor Shellfish, something else like that, well, 
we check out the historical reputation. And so even though Jamestown doesn't, whether you guys agree with us or not on why we partnered and you know, were they the right partner, we chose yes. Um, and because we were studying that reputation and we studied what they did, we studied their family, what their values were, and it, it matched up with us enough to where we said yes. And so then we went forward from there on what does that reputation mean? What does that contract and that partnership look like? I hope that makes sense. Okay, I'm seeing lots of head nods, great. <laughs> All right, um, I thought I saw you first. If you wanna come up here and ask your question, that would be great. These work now? Yes. Okay. All right, cool. All right, I'm yeah, I'm <laughs> uh, hi, yeah, so I'm Zach Paiga. I'm trying to start a, set, a uh, kelp farm up in San Juan Islands. And so I'm curious, like, it's uh, cool that you've mentioned partnering, because what is the best way as like an outsider to establish an equitable partnership with the local tribes and like get them to actually respond to your emails? Relationship building, you know, so how do you build relationships with people that um, are not responding? Uh, you go to where they are, you know, whether it be, you know, conferences like this or other conferences or you know, you, you, you just start learning about them and you listen to what they have to say about the area. And the more you listen, the more that they feel that they're heard and, that, that, and respected, I think the better chance you have of having a response email. <laughs> and, and learn about who they are before you try to make too many attempts to outreach. The reason I say this is, you know, recognize that each tribe is this sovereign nation. And guess what? They don't all hold the same view. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they have many different views. And embedded in that is the fact that different tribes have different legal rights. And you know, for people outside of tribal country, that gets real complicated real quickly. They don't understand it. They don't figure, they can't understand why they call one tribe and they get an answer and they call another tribe and they found out, you talked with them, we're not talking to you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You, you have to kind of learn that landscape before you get too far down the road. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wonderful. I, we have our next question from you here. We want to give your name and your question. That'd be great. Um, Jackie Dexter with Hold Fast Mary Culture, Future Kelp and Blue Mussel Farm in Whatcom County. And as I'm beginning the permitting process, uh, there's five tribes that I'm hoping to appease to and, and permit through. But I recognize that all tribes have UNA in the state, and I'm wondering if other tribes would appreciate that line of communication early on as well, that maybe don't um, utilize those grounds, but let's have those partnerships and communications. And I don't know how much further south I need to go because I'm up by Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, similar to what I just said, UNA is not the same everywhere. Tribes have overlapping UNAs. There are things called primary UNAs and secondary UNAs. There's tribes that could, their members could legally fish in a location, but only if they were invited by the local tribe to fish there. So UNA is not just one thing. It's complicated as well. And um, you know, in the case of location, I, I mean, I don't think you need to talk about what you're doing with the Squaxin Island Tribe if you're doing it in Clallam County. But on the other hand, there's fish management decisions that go on up in, you know, Area 8, Area 9 that Squaxin has an interest in and a role in. And so, you know, things get complicated and you... <laughs> There's no I'll easy send you answer. A 6.3 notice of intent. 
I guess I'll just quickly fall. I mean, Jeff said it. I, if there's something going on outside of my UNA, I feel like the, tri the tribe of that UNA would not appreciate me getting in their business. Okay, I'm getting some head nods, yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm just saying, if you're doing something outside of Jamestown's UNA, like you're up in Whatcom County, that's not us, um, then we, we, might, we might just notice from far away and see what's going on, but we won't officially comment or anything like that, because it's just not our area. All right, wonderful. Uh, Nicole, you want to ask your question. So I'm Nicole Nara with Washington Sea Grant. Um, first, thank you all so much for being here today and sharing your um, knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about um, some of the stories about how some of your ancestors um, practiced aquaculture. Um, and it reminded me of something that I've learned as an anthropologist, um, thinking about terrestrial uh, ecosystems. We distinguish between horticulture, which is for anthropologists, small scale, biodiverse systems um, that are usually pretty sustainable and practice primarily for subsistence. And that we contrast with agriculture, large scale, technologically intensive crops, mostly for commercial purposes. And I was wondering if you all thought that like a, a term like marine horticulture would be something useful to add to this conversation about what aquaculture is, or if you think that would just make things more confusing. <laughs> go ahead, go on. I'm a non scientist, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, I have a concern, a frustration perhaps, um, embedded in, in what you said and, and how you, the distinction you made. And, and that was the use of the term commercial. Um, and you know, it also goes to my frustration with the aforementioned state agency who's trying to ban commercial fish farming. It's like, what's commercial? I mean, I'm not the lawyer here, but it seems to me you, you've got a pretty fuzzy line as to what may or may not be commercial. And if, if I were growing, if I created a, a kelp farm purely for restoration activities to provide habitat or whatnot. But, you know, at some point I needed to harvest the kelp to remove, say, carbon from the water column. Can I sell it? Is that commercial? There was, it's not an industrial operation, but is it commercial? So I, I hope everybody thinks about the terminology a little bit and uh, as far as horticulture, agriculture, I don't know, just mariculture, <laughs> covers everything. <laughs> In brief, I would say from a cultural standpoint, uh, terms like that, we have our, we have our own words. So at least in, in my cultural, when I wear my cultural hat, I'm a ceremonial leader as well. We just, we have our own words, so I wouldn't use terms like that. Um, every one of our brothers and sisters in creation has its own name, but then underneath all of that, they're just underneath this umbrella of Shetung you know, the land, the living land, or the living sea, the living waters, living skies. Um, so. If those terms, I, I will just say, like, we adapt, tribes adapt to the terms that come, up, come along. And so if that is something that is, comes along in our, in our daily work, we will find a way to adapt to it and retranslate it into our own indigenous terms. But you probably won't hear a lot of us on the tribal lands use it, just from a cultural standpoint. All right, that actually brings us to time, but I wanna allow you guys any closing remarks, if you have anything that you wanna say, just as a last 30 seconds or a minute <laughs> to share, it's entirely up to you. <laughs> uh, just briefly touching on that, <clears throat> when I was talking about this uh, project earlier, the term 
farm and restoration came up. And I was like, I thought they were the same thing. <laughs> like, aren't we, are we after the same thing? So just that's something that I'm going to go back and think about. And that kind of fits with what she was saying about the horticulture versus agriculture. Kind of like where I sit with that. Like, I'm, that's some research that I want to do to see where I sit with that. I want to just comment on, and say what, uh, or refer to what Lonnie just said, that they have different words. So recognize that, yes, we're all speaking English, but it's different cultures. I figure that, like I said, I've been working on the tribe for 36 years. I figured it took me a good five or six years working there every day before I started to understand. That's my tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, I think, you know, food production is important just in general and, and using the water body for food production in the terms of aquaculture or whatnot. I think, you know, like, it's, it's an easy concept, and I get a lot of frustrations if we're not doing it, where it's like if we're harvesting it, there has to be some of that it's to, to put back, you know, that, that concept of, of putting back what was taken and, and seeding. Um, and, and if we go for a period of time without seeding beaches, people are, you know, feel the frustrations, you know, and what we term that, I, you know, I don't know, but it's, but it's a, you know, um, Using the using the water for food production for for human consumption and human cultural, uh, you know, representation. I think it's it's a, it's an important important thing, and and engaging early again. That's really, you know, learning the, the tribes that are that are active in the area that have jurisdiction for the particular spot that you happen to be a proponent of uh, putting in a you know some type of farm. Uh, what's going to serve you the best to start learning those tribes and getting in touch with them early. Last word. <laughs> Tribes are ancient people, and then we're also forever people. So we'll be here. We'll be here with the land because that was what the Creator told us to do. Be here, steward the land, steward the seas. Um, and so we just continue to evolve with what's going on around us. And now, with you know climate change as an example. You know, that's, that's a new thing. We, now we have a different type of protection and stewarding that we have to do and, um, you know, trying to figure out what do we do with kelp as it's declining? How do we help it, you know? So I guess my just leaving you with, we're an ancient people, we're a forever people, but I'm really glad I have partners like you all out there to help me with the science, to help me with different perspectives, to help me with resources, different tools, different ways of thinking, different ways of trying to problem solve and brainstorm. We need everybody, our land and our seas, our air, we need everybody. So I'm just grateful for that partnership with you all too. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody so much. <laughs>